All right, folks, so here is the Euthyphro lecture. Um, what's starting off here, we'll go ahead and describe what happens in the dialogue, go some quotes from it and summarize it, and kind of what the takeaway is. Uh, same lecture I gave in class a couple days ago, the audio and video were not quality from that, so I couldn't use them to, unfortunately, um, part, make this lecture from, so I have to do a raw take of it at home, which is fine. But uh, basically, here we go. So the basics of Euthyphro is Socrates is coming to court to be tried for uh, corrupting the youth and his disbelief in the gods. That's the charge that Miletus, who is a, or Miletus, who is a young man of Athens and an up-and-coming politician, uh, has laid against Socrates. And on his way to court, Socrates comes upon his friend Euthyphro. Euthyphro is a lawyer of Athens and a politician as well, right? And so he's a very, very well-known, very well-liked individual in the Athenian society. And what happens is... Uh, Socrates begins to engage him in a con uh, conversation. And if you get the point that by now, um, or by the end of this dialogue, people don't like talking to Socrates very much, it's largely because he's um, known to get you going on this conversation that has no end to it and uh, will keep you occupied for you know two or three quarters of a day. And so Euthyphro is very hesitant to even bring up a, in conversation anything with Socrates, but Socrates persists and wears him down finally and begins talking with him about this piety thing. So how does this happen? How does this dialogue begin? And what is this piety we're talking about um, as Euthyphro and Socrates are trying to discover? So the piety itself um, can be understood through the concept of pietas, which is a Roman word, um, which is a translation of the Greek, uh, the Greek word for piety. Now what piety means to the Romans, which is very important, and you will see this in um, the Aeneid, you see the picture of the Aeneid from, in the, the, rather the sculpturing of the Aeneid picture, that Aeneas is leading his son out of the ruins of Troy by the hand while carrying his father Anchises on his back, like over his shoulder, like a sack of potatoes. And this is the idea that piety is to Romans. It's a filial, uh, being a son-like or a duty of the son to the father and to the family. And so it's obeying the father's wishes or demands, um, obeying family rules, uh, giving the father or the uh, giving the father respect, and treating any command he has as if it was derived from the gods, because it is in a sense the gods for the Greeks are like the fathers of humanity and mothers of humanity. So we have a filial duty, a piet duty of pietas to the gods who are like our um, fathers and mothers in Olympus and so the authority that a father or mother has in the household and the authority the state has over the individual in, a, in the, uh, the, uh, the pol polis or the Greek state which Athens is one um, derives from the same notion of authority as the gods have over humanity and so the piety that Euthyphro and Socrates are doing are talking about here trying to get to the bottom of is not piety in the religious sense like we have today like being religiously dutiful and going to church and um, not being bo uh, boastful or obstreperous or prideful and being pretty much a, a good straight shooting kind of person. For the Greeks it's more encompassing than that. So for Socrates it's everything. Like the nature of piety and impiety is the nature of right and wrong. What's good and what's bad, what's just, what's unjust writ large. It's not a limited to religious or to social conduct. It's for everything in the whole. So Socrates is asking Euthyphro, I mean blankly, what's good and what's bad? What's moral, what's immoral? What's just, what's unjust? Like, how do you know right from wrong? How do you tell any of those things in the real world? And so Euthyphro is claiming that he'd be an expert in these things, and Socrates wants to try this knowledge because that's what Socrates kind of does, right? Socrates is a skeptic, and so he goes around and fames either his own ignorance on a subject or at least yields to the intellectual superiority of whoever it is he's talking to and then kind of gets them to question their own beliefs and values. The reason for this is because in Socrates' way of thinking, his morality or his worldview, the only reason that human beings um, commit actions that are immoral or make wrong action is because of ignorance. He thinks that if human beings only knew what the right answer was, only knew what was right and wrong, or the results that would come about from their hacking a wrong action, they would not do it. They would never willfully choose to make a bad action that would result in bad consequences for them if they knew beforehand what it would do. I think human history has proven this not to necessarily be true, but for Socrates, starting off, this was the basic tenet of his philosophy, that if we only knew the outcomes of our actions, or what was pious, or what was impious, we would never choose the bad uh, willfully. And so he believed that you can find out what morality is if you question people enough to get the truth 
to the situation to become aware of them to become aware of the truth, then the immorality and unjust action would go away. Along this line, Socrates also believed that the truth of the universe, every, all knowledge, all moral compass, all moral answers, all judgments were innately within each and every one of us as human beings. We were all perfected in a sense to know morality, right from wrong, just from unjust, but we only had to realize through questioning that we actually already knew this in order to become uh, a more perfect, a more wise, just human being. And thus, his method of questioning everyone is based on this premise, which is, if I ask you enough times or the right way or break down your ignorance to the point where you have to accept the knowledge that's already within you, if I get you to answer the question the right way, the truth is already within you, I'm just drawing it out of you. So that's why you have this kind of interrogation-like method for Socrates, because he believes everyone has the right answer. The truth is within somebody, it's his job to pull it out of them. Kind of like a psychologist or a psychiatrist will put you on the couch and talk to you about, like, oh, like what was your childhood like? Oh, yeah, well, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? To get you ultimately to articulate the answer yourself, not that he's giving you the answer. And Socrates has the same approach for his dialogues as well as his notion of morality and um, social conduct in general. So that said, let's go ahead and begin the old uh, dialogue. So Socrates finds Euthyphro uh, on the steps of the Agora, which is the place where the Greeks hold, or the Athenians hold court, um, as well as political meetings, voting, etc., etc., and he comes up to him and he's like, oh, Euthyphro, what's up? How you doing, man? So Euthyphro's like, hi, Socrates, I'm kind of busy, like a little bit busy here, you don't, do you mind? Socrates is like, well, what are you doing? Are you trying somebody at court today? Because Euthyphro's a lawyer. And Euthyphro says, yes, I am, in fact, a case of murder. Socrates responds, like, oh, no, who, 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 pray tell you charging with murder? Um, how did this, how did this come about? This is a terrible, dreadful case. And, um, <laughs> and Socrates responds, that, uh, let me find the actual quote. Yeah. Um, where is it? Here we go. Sorry. Um, he says, wow, a murderer, that must be really terrible. He must be a really bad guy. It must be, like, totally mischievous and full of, uh, you know, full of bad will. And Euthyphro says, nay, he's not very volatile at this time of his life. Who is he? My father. Your father? Good heavens. Don't, you don't mean that. Euthyphro says, yes. And what is he accused of? Murder, Socrates. By the powers, Euthyphro, how little does the common herd know of the nature of right and truth? A man must be an extraordinary man to have made great strides in wisdom before he could have seen his way into this. Euthyphro says, indeed, Socrates, he must have made great strides. Socrates responds, I suppose that the man whom your father murdered was one of your relatives. If he had murdered a peasant or a serf, there would be no way you would bring him up on charges, right? And Euthyphro says, I am amused, Socrates, by your making a distinction between he, one who is a relation and one who is not a relation. For surely the pollution is the same in either case. If you knowingly associate with a murderer, when you ought to clear yourself by proceeding against him, the real question is whether the murdered man has been justly slain. If justly, then your duty is to let the man alone. But if unjustly, then even if the murderer is one under the same roof as you and eats from the same table as you, proceed against him. Now the man who is dead was a poor dependent of mine who worked in the field for us as a laborer at Naxos. And one day, in a fit of drunken passion, he got into a quarrel with one of our domestic servants and slew him. My father bound him, hand and foot, and threw him into a ditch. And then he sent to Athens to ask a diviner what he should do with him. Meantime, he had no care or thought of him, being under the impression that he was a murderer, and that even if he did die, there would be no great harm, and this was just what happened. For such a man was the effect of cold and hunger and chains upon him, that before the messenger returned from the diviner, he was dead. My father and family are now angry with me for taking the part of the murderer and prosecuting my father. They say that he did not kill him, and if he did, the man was a, but a murderer, and he ought to be slain anyways, and no one should take any notice of this, for that a son is impious who prosecutes a father. That shows, Socrates, how little they know of the opinions of gods about piety and impiety. Right? So basically what he's saying, the, the, the quandary of the matter is thus, that Socrates thinks that you should make a distinction or wonders if it's pious to prosecute your father, um, given this notion of like filial piety, of duty to the father, duty to the family. And Euthyphro says, look, dude, like morality, right and wrong, does not matter upon who is the person you're judging. That's subjective. That's not justice. That's not piety. If my dad murdered somebody, then I should charge him with murder. If some guy I don't even know, Joe Blow on the street, murdered somebody, I should charge him with murder. If he didn't do it, then I should not charge him with murder. It's all about the action itself and not about who the person is or what the situations are that determines justice and unjustness, right? And Socrates seems to push on this a little bit. Uh, to try to get Euthyphro to interrogate himself and see if he actually um, 
knows what he's talking about. And so the issue here, right, is that Euthyphros takes up the point that he knows what's pious and impious, or he knows that it doesn't matter who the person who's being impious is, you still should prosecute them if they're being bad. So wrong is wrong, no matter what, 100%. And if somebody's doing wrong, it's not, it's also wrong to not prosecute them. To condone them or to be silent about it is also wrong. So Socrates asks him to push this a little bit further, right? So Socrates says, Good heavens, Euthyphro, and have you such a precise knowledge of piety and impiety, and of divine things in general, that supposing circumstances be as you state, you are not afraid that you too might be doing an impious thing by bringing a charge against your father? So basically he says, Euthyphro, you think you're hot crap, right? You think you got this on lock? You think you know exactly, according to the gods, what's pious and impious? If you don't know exactly, 100%, 130%, what's pious or impious according to the gods, why would you proceed with this? Because you risk being impious too if you're not completely certain that your father's action was impious. Right? And so, Euthyphro responds that the best of Euthyphro and that which distinguishes him, Socrates, from any other man is his exact knowledge in all these matters. What, sh what good should I be without that? So he's like, I'm a lawyer, dude. This is what I do. I have exact knowledge. I'm the best of all, the best of the best of all men with knowing what is pious and unpious. Because I'm in the court all the time. I'm helping people get judged impious or pious. I'm a prosecutor, dude. This is what I do. I know injustice when I see it, and I know justice when I see it. And let me just take these, um, take this down as a note to my character, right? And so, Socrates then begins to disseminate um, this, uh, dissemble Euthyphro's argument. He says, oh my goodness, well, thank God. Like, and this is a thing, too, to th realize about Socrates at this point in time. Is Socrates is playing Euthyphro. Right, like Socrates is not sincere in any of this. He's ironic. He's he's guiding. He's uh, chiding him. He's working up his ego and also mocking him at the same time. This is meant to be somewhat humorous um, as a dialogue, but more than that, it's also supposed to be revealing of the way Socrates approaches people and things, and also of Euthyphro's flaws in his own um, thought, uh, thinking of himself or construction of himself as an expert in piety. Right. So Socrates proposes this scheme to Euthyphro. He's like, well, Euthyphro, guess what? Like. I'm brought here on charges of being unpious and of worshipping false gods and denying the real gods exist. Um, my accuser is Miletus, who's this punk kid who he, Socrates describes him as having a long pointed nose and he can't uh, grow uh, an Apache beard. So he kind of assaults the, the uh, accuser Miletus' masculinity and manhood from the beginning saying, oh, he can grow this like patchy looking Joe Dirt beard, not a real beard, so he's not much of a man. He's bringing this accusation against me like he's a man. It's kind of an interesting notion of um, masculinity and challenge and uh, ad hominem attack Socrates is perpetuating against Miletus when he talks to Euthyphro. But I'll, anyways, um, so Socrates comes up with a plan that, like, look, Euthyphro, what we should do is this. Since you are the master, since you know so much about all these matters, what we should do is I will say, when I go to my defense, that you are my master. I'm an idiot. Socrates doesn't know anything. Socrates is just doing stupid because Socrates is a fool. And he'll walk in and be like, da -da -da, I'm Socrates, I don't know anything. And I'll say, my friend, um, my, my mentor here, Euthyphro, uh, knows everything. He's, he's so wise, and he taught me what I know. And so because of that, the Greeks won't be able to charge Socrates with being unpious because it's Euthyphro who taught him, so Euthyphro is responsible for him. And Euthyphro can say, I'm sorry, my idiot student Socrates was acting crazy. Um, let me go back and instruct him properly, and it won't be a big deal. But charge me if you must. And then Miletus, Socrates says, will never charge you because you're liked by everybody. Everybody loves you. And since you're Mr. Politician, Mr. Everybody Loves, Mr. Um, speaks for the Gods, Mr. Just and Pious, at that point in time, they'll have no choice but to drop the charges because they won't charge you with this because it's obvious you're not unpious. It's obvious you're not um, a defier of the Gods. And they'll be like, oh, well, Socrates is being stupid and doing stupid stuff. But it's not his fault. He's just his poorly instructed. So we'll fix that instruction and be good to go, right? So he's kind of, this is all a sham, though, right? He's blowing up Euthyphro's... Um, Oh, what do you call it? Euthyphro's ego. He's inflating his ego and saying, Man, Euthyphro, you're so smart. I should be your disciple. I, I can't do this by myself. I'm so stupid. I've done errors in my ways. And if you would only be my math mentor, then we could um, clear this whole matter up, right? And so Euthyphro uh, responds when Socrates tells him that Miletus would not dare indict you, Euthyphro. You're too cool. And Euthyphro says, Yes, Socrates. And if he attempts to indict me, I am mistaken if I don't find a flaw in him. The court shall have a great deal more to say with him than to me. So Euthyphro is like, oh yeah, if he tries to indict me, I'll flip the script and get him taken away, get him uh, put to death for impiety or, or whatever I want to do because I have that kind of fla flavor with words and that kind of favor with the court, right? Um, Socrates says, I know that, dear friend, 
and this is the reason why I desire to be your disciple. For I observe that no one, not even Melitus, appears to notice you, but his sharp eyes have found me out at once, and he has indicted me for impiety, and therefore I adjure you to tell me the nature of piety and impiety, which you said you know so well, and of murder and the rest of them. What are they? Is not piety in every action the same, and impiety, again, is that not always the opposite of piety, and so the same with itself, having as impiety notion of that which includes whatever is impious? So, right, what he says is basically let, if you could only instruct me, Euthyphro, as to what the nature of piety is, the true nature of it, and the true nature of impiety, then all my ignorance will be cured. And at that point in time, I can stop being stupid, and I can know what's pious and unpious, and never choose the, pi- the unpious, I'll always choose the pious. Once I know what right and wrong is, I'm always, I'm always going to choose the right. I'm just stupid. That's why I do bad things. And Euthyphro is like, okay, Socrates, yeah, I'll do this. I'll take up your, uh, your case here. Let's figure out what these things are. And then Socrates says, so to define what the action or what piety is itself, you need to look at what's common in all actions that are pious, right? Like if things are moral, then there's got to be something in common with all of them that makes them moral. It can't just be random assemblings of like of actions. All things that are moral have to have a commonality, and all things that are immoral have to have a commonality with them. So what is that commonality? And Euthyphro begins to try to describe this, right? He says, piety is doing as I am doing, that is to say, prosecuting anyone who is guilty of murder, sacrilege, or of any other similar crime, whether he be your father or mother or some other person, that makes no difference, and not prosecuting them is impiety. And please consider, Socrates, what a noble proof I will give you of the truth of what I am saying, which I have already given to others. For the truth, I mean, of the principle that the impious, whoever he may be, ought not to go unpunished. For do not men who regard Zeus as the best and most righteous of the gods? And even then they admit that he bound his father, Kronos, because he wickedly devoured his sons, and that he too punished his own father, Uranus, for a similar reason, in a nameless manner. And yet, when I proceed against my father, they are angry with me. This is their inconsistent way of talking when the gods are concerned, and when I am concerned. Right? So Socrates begins by, like, mocking the hell out of Euthyphro, right? He says essentially like, well, Euthyphro, you're so great. I'm so stupid. Like, that's why they say I don't have any piety for the gods or any love of the gods because I don't know anything about the gods. The gods mean nothing to me. I mean, I'm sure Zeus is a great guy, but these stories you tell, these great tales about um, Zeus killing his father and Zeus's father Kronos killing his father Uranus. I've never heard these before. I'm so ignorant and stupid. And if you could only tell me more uh, stories about the gods, or if only I knew these stories about the gods to back up my morality, then they'd never indict me on anything. Because they'd be like, oh yeah, well, Jupiter did this, and Herod did this, and Herophides did this. And so this is how the gods act. So this is how we should act. He's like, tell me more stuff about the gods, Euthyphro. You're so wise because you know about the gods. And Euthyphro says, yes, Socrates, as I was saying, I can tell you, if you'd like to hear them, many other things about the gods which would, want, which would quite amaze you. So he takes Socrates being ironic and mocking him as being, like, really praising him right here. He's like, oh yeah, Socrates. You know what? I can tell you so much about the gods would make your head swim. And yeah, I am really no knowledge about the gods. You're right, Socrates. And Socrates is more sitting there like, yeah, Euthyphro, how big was the monster? Uh, how many tentacles did it have? How many gods did it take to bring down the wall? And Euthyphro is like, oh, he's like 30 gods. Oh, yeah, he was gigantic. He was huge. 40 tentacles, Socrates. Like telling tall tales. And Socrates is mocking him that he's not buying any of it. He's like, tell me about the gods, Euthyphro. Tell me about the gods. And Euthyphro is just like, I will. I, you bet I will. Here we go. Right? And then Socrates interjects again when he starts talking about the gods. He's like, I dare say you know a lot about the gods. And you shall tell me at some other time these stories when I have leisure. But at the present, I would rather hear from you on a more precise answer of what is piety and what is not piety. Right? So he's like, look, dude, I know I said I want to hear God stories, and they're really cute and all, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I actually want to get you back on task here with telling me what piety is and what piety is not, because this is what actually matters to me here. So Euthyphro is kind of put it back. He's like, okay, I guess that's true, Socrates. Go ahead. Um, what's Socrates on so- what's, uh, yeah, what's pious and impious? And so he says, um, Socrates asks, So, oh, sorry, so- Socrates asked him, so is not piety the same in all circumstances and impiety the same in all circumstances? I mean, what's pious and unpious? And you don't give me examples of things that are pious, like doing what you do. So that doesn't help me out in knowing the nature of piety, like, because I'm not you, so I can never do what you do or mimic you in any way. So what is the nature of the essence of piety? Aren't there lots of acts that become, can, be, can be pious? 
Um, and Euthyphro says, fine, there are. There are a lot of acts that can be pious, right? And Socrates says, good. Then remember, I didn't want you to just give me a list of pious actions. That's stupid. I wanted you to give me the general idea, the essence of piety and um, impiety itself, right? And so he says, do you not recollect that there was one idea which made the impious impious and the pious pious? Euthyphro says, I remember. So tell me what that is, and then I shall have a standard by which to look, and by which I may measure m the nature of actions, whether yours or anyone else's, or said that the action is pious and this one is unpious. So the question now moves into the second part of the dialogue of Euthyphro. So the, I should have said this before, there are really three movements or three main parts in Euthyphro. The first part is the Socrates conning Euthyphro into actually talking with him and bringing him up the charges of murder he's bringing against his father. Right? The second part of it is the idea about measuring standards and evaluating of moral actions as opposed to evaluating of concrete items, right? And so Socrates in the second part it wants the standard by which we can tell something's pious or unpious, moral or immoral, right? And so Euthyphro is not providing Socrates with the standard, but the examples. And so Socrates says, all your examples don't add up to a standard we can use to actually apply to everything. It's merely a given case, and a given case can't be extrapolated to prove the whole truth of something, right? It's an it's a anecdotal piece of evidence, not a definite piece of evidence, not a fact, right? Like, you can say that, okay, I hold this ball up in the air and drop it, and it hits the earth. I hold this um, lamp up in the air and drop it, and it hits the earth. I jump off a tree, uh, and I hit the earth. That does not give me what the universal constant for gravity is, right? Or that gravity exists. There's not even a theorem to be deduced on those. Those are three individual events which each have an outcome which are similar. But you can't get to the law of gravity or what gravitational force is at any given point from dropping single objects off of walls or off of trees or out of houses, right? It just gives you things breaking on the ground and the things fall, right? To get the actual constant that's the law of nature, you have to have the evaluative criteria itself, the standard of gravity to apply. There's a difference between a theory and an anecdotal piece of evidence, right? So, the question now is, how do you find out what the standard of measure for piety is? And Socrates gives the example that, okay, if we have two big rocks, right? We have two giant rocks, and you say your rock weighs more than my rock is, does, right? We have ways through scales and balances and weights to figure out which one of these rocks actually weighs more. If I have two cups of water, one's half full and one's empty, or has a little drop in it, then you claim the empty one is has more water in it than my full one, or my half full one, then we have, a, we have evaluative standards by which we can compare these things and determine which one of us is right or wrong. If you say that you have more money than I do, and you have eight gold coins, and I have six gold coins, we have numerical quantity, which allows us to determine whether you're right or wrong, right? So there are claims in the real world which have factual evaluative criteria that we can then decide how to weigh those facts, if they're actually true or actually false, which claims right, which claims wrong. With morality and ethics and piety, we don't have such a lovely standard. There's no universal standard of morality that if you're on this side of it, it's all good, and on this side of it, you're all bad. Or at least human beings do not agree on any one set standard for what that, where that line is or what that objective criterion is, right? And so what this becomes is how do we tell what's right or wrong? And Euthyphro says, well, we look to the gods because the gods are what give us piety. What's moral to the gods is what should be moral to us. They're the ideal form of us, right? Gods are idealized human beings in this anthropomorphic sense of, of divinity, right? And so, as Euthyphro says, we do what the gods do. What's just for the gods is what's just for us. Just like Zeus killed his father, or Zeus put his, yeah, killed his father, and his father killed his father, I can try my father for murder. And Socrates says, okay, but doesn't something that's pious all the time be pious all the time? Like, if something's right, it has to be right in all circumstances. If something's universally wrong, it has to be wrong in all circumstances. And the gods themselves do not agree on what's pious or impious. Hell, the gods are terrible. The gods go around raping and pillaging and murdering each other all the time. And interfering with human affairs and raping and pillaging and murdering human beings all the time, too. And they disagree with, the, with each other so much that they have wars in, in Olympus about which is right and which is wrong. So how are we going to use them as the standard for telling what's right and wrong in this world? They don't even agree on it themselves, right? And that's where we get into the problem that Euthyphro eventually can't um, break Socrates on this idea about the enmity between the gods, right? Gods hate each other, gods fight each other. If they're supposed to be always right, then if they contradict each other on an issue, how can they always be right when they're saying different, shot, different stuff, right? So that's the ultimate uh, point of this part of the dialogue, which is just to talk about that we can't have the gods as a standard for knowing what's right or wrong, because they do everything, both sides, and contradict themselves, right?
So that said, the next point we got to bring up, um, and that's really the rest of the dialogue up until the third point, which is the idea of the expert. So let me pull that. Here we go. So about the gods, though, right? Euthyphro says, But I believe, Socrates, that all the gods were to be agreed as to the pri propriety of punishing a murderer. There will be no difference in the opinions among them. If there had been so no such differences, why would there be now? Right? Euthyphro says, You're quite right. Does it not every man love that which he deems noble and just and good, and hate that which opposes them? Very true. Socrates says, Well, then, as you say, people regard the same things as just and unjust as others, and they dispute about this. And there are dire wars and fights among them. Euthyphro, yes, it's true. Then the same things as appears are hated by the gods and loved by the gods and are both hateful and loved by men. Right? So upon this view, can the same thing Euthyphro, the same thing Euthyphro will be pious and unpious. Meaning that if you have people who have disputes about the nature of what's right or wrong, and you have gods that have disputes over the nature of what's right or wrong, then you can have one thing and it's considered both pious and impious by gods depending on which god you are, and same thing from people. It's pious or impious, depending on who you are and what your perspective is. And that's the problem, right? Uh, because Socrates says, Then, my friend, I remark with surprise that you've not answered what I asked. For I certainly did not ask you which was the one pious and impious, and that which is loved by the gods appears to be hated by the gods. Therefore, Euthyphro, I'm chastising you thus, because you are not giving me an agreeable answer. Here we go. Um, doing what is agreeable to Zeus but disagreeable to Kronos or Uranus and was acceptable to Hephe Hephaestus but un unacceptable to Hera and other gods who have similar differences of opinion, right? Does not answer me what's always pious and what's always impious. You've not given me any clue into the nature of these things. You've only said um, contradictory pieces of evidence. And how can you be so sure that your pious action of charging your father with murder is actually pious if some of the gods would agree with you and some wouldn't? There has to be universal harmony with the gods in order to actually have justice and piety according to your own standard. And so... How does this fit that? How is this not contradictory to your own point? Right? And Euthyphro kind of gets uh, hung up here, and he says, Ah, but Socrates, I believe that all the gods would be agreed it's the propriety of punishing a murderer. There would be no difference of opinion. And then he says, I understand, and you mean to say that I'm not so quick of apprehension as the judges, for to them you will be sure to prove that the act is just and hateful to the gods. He said, Yes, indeed, Socrates. At least they will listen to me. And he says, you'll listen because you're a good speaker, right? The whole point of this is we not, should not have to convince people uh, through our speeches, through our good orations and our defenses and technicalities, what's right or wrong. We should be able to determine what's universally right or wrong and act that standard, right? So if we don't act to that standard and always do what's right, then we could be caught in unawares with subjectivity or having a bad day and act in ways that are unpious. And we should never try to do that. So even though you might be acting pious in this case, you might not be. And if you don't have a standard to show why you're doing that, then, well... I can't trust you as far as what's pious or unpious, right? And so he says then, but the third part of the dialogue is about the experts. So he says, Socrates says, well, Euthyphro, how would you determine what's, uh, what's good for a horse? Or what's good for, yeah, what's good for a horse? And he says, well, I wouldn't know anything about that, Socrates. I'm not a horseman. He's like, I know you're not. But the equestrian, the guy who owns the stables, he is. So you would presume that if you had a question about horses or horse matters, you'd go to him and he'd be your person to answer that. He knows through experience. And if I had a question about nutrition, I would go to a nutritionist and say, hey, what should I eat today? Because I want to have nutrients in my body and be healthy and live in a balanced kind of way of dietary consumption. And I wouldn't go ask a school teacher or I wouldn't go ask uh, the uh, manure removal guy from the dog park what the nutrition uh, I need as a person is. I wouldn't go to a lawyer if I wanted to talk about how to remove this callus from my foot. I wouldn't go to a podiatrist if I wanted to prosecute somebody or talk about tort law or inheritance law, right? So everybody has an expert, every field has an expert who you consult with matters when there are differing opinions or there's a problematic question you don't know the answer to. So he's like, okay, who is this regarding, law, regarding right and wrong? And who's the moral arbiter who's the expert of all things pious or unpious, right? Does that exist in... Uh, humanity does it exist for the gods as well, right? And the question is that there aren't these things for people. And the result of the conversation is that these things, such as morality and immorality, just and ju unjust, right and wrong, are never agreed upon by human beings across cultures, across even societies, or across families. And so, this is the cause of all human strife. Socrates uh, proposes 
is the inability to have any kind of a consensus notion of what's just or unjust, moral and immoral, right or wrong. And because of this, some people will think invading a country is right, and the people in that country will think it's wrong. But because they have differing opinions in different cultures, there's no way to evaluate which is actually right and wrong, and so there are wars fought, and all human strife, he says, is a result of this inability to have an expert in morality, and the inability to agree as a whole people, or a whole humankind, as to what's right or wrong. If we could do this, then wars would become meaningless, but we never can, because we don't have the insight into this aspect of human life, the way we do into weights and measures, or of breeding a good horse, right? And that's kind of the ultimate crux of the dilemma here. All right. So at the end of the dialogue, right, Socrates says, more or less he uh, abjures or he humiliates or tries to shame Euthyphro by saying, well, obviously you must know what piety is because you're going to prosecute your father for murder and you seem so sure of yourself that there's no way you could possibly be wrong. And I'd be careful of you because if you know if you are wrong, they could find you impious for the gods. The gods could like curse you or say take something out against you or so could the court. So you must be 130% sure that you're totally pious and you're totally right and know what piety is and know what right and wrong are. But you won't tell me, jackass. Like, come on. I'm your best friend or whatever. I'm going to go there and die because Malaysia is going to have me put to death for not knowing what's pious and unpious if you don't tell me what it is. So you can't even help me out. You're no fun. Like, let's start this whole conversation again at the beginning, right? He's like, um, then we must begin again and ask, what is piety? That's an inquiry which I should never be wary of pursuing as far as in me lies. And I entreat you not to scorn me, but to apply your mind to the utmost and tell me the truth. For if any man knows, you are he, and therefore I shall detain you like Proteus until you tell. For if you had not certainly known the nature of piety and impiety, I am confident that you would never, on behalf of a serf, have charged your father with murder. You would not have run such a risk of doing harm or wrong in the sight of the gods, when you would have so much respect for the opinions of men, I'm sure, therefore, you do not know the nature, you know the nature of piety and impiety. Speak then, my dear Euthyphro, and do not hide your knowledge. So basically he's saying, Euthyphro, you care what everybody thinks about you so much, you wouldn't want to risk being impious in their eyes by being wrong. You won't run the risk of being eyes and wrong in the eyes of the gods because they'd smite you. So you must know what it is. So tell me. Stop hiding it. Stop lying to me, Euthyphro. And then Euthyphro says, Another time, Socrates, for I'm in a hurry and must go. So we're like, I got to bounce, bro. Like, I have to go try my father for murder. And we're back at the beginning point again. I can't get anywhere with you, Socrates. I'm going to go. So in he goes. And that's kind of the, uh, the end. And Socrates closes by saying, Alas, my companion, and you will leave me in despair. I was hoping that you would instruct me into the nature of piety and impiety so that I might have cleared myself of Miletus and his indictment. Then I must have proved to him that I be converted by Euthyphro and had done with rash invocations and speculations in which I had indulged through ignorance and was about to lead a better life. So he basically says, if, I had, if you would have helped me out and told me what piety and impiety were, I could have gone before in the court and been, look, up until five minutes ago I was an idiot. I had no clue what I was doing. I was totally wrong about everything. But Euthyphro here, he's a genius. He knows piety. He knows impiety for sure, 100% for sure. And he told me what it was. And now I know what it is. God, I was an idiot. Stupid me. Duh. I'm going to go live a better life now. Miletus, you're right. But I can be fixed now. Look, I've, I've been cured. I've been healed. I've been um, reformed. Found, come, have my come to Jesus moment. We're doing well. And now I'm going to go on and live my life well. Because Euthyphro here told me what was right. But since you're not telling me what's right, Euthyphro, I can't do that. Woe is me. And kind of this whiny, mocking tone is how it ends. And then Euthyphro goes his way to charge his father with murder. And Socrates walks into the Agora to begin his trial. But we'll begin next time with the apology or the defense of Socrates. Cheers, y'all. Thank you.